All right, you guys ready? Yeah, you ready for the word? Man, I'm ready to give it. Now, before we start, let me pray, all right? Let me pray. If you would, please bow your head. Father, I just lift up each and every person right here, right now, under the sound of my voice, and I pray that you would minister to to them, bless them, encourage them, lift them up, God. God, have your way. And Father, I pray that something that I'm about to say is going to change our hearts, all of us together, in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody says Amen. amen. Now, before we go any further, today is a very, very special day. We have Westfield, Kokomo, all together, right here, right now. How many of you know that's cool? Uh, Come on, welcome them, praise God. Get this, today is Westfield's one year anniversary, Pastor Tope. Come on now, woo baby, tearing it up. Tearing it up in Westfield, baby. It's awesome. So, hey, we're thrilled for them. One year, it's exciting. They're doing big things, man. They're growing faster than we, we, I mean, obviously, this is our first shot at it, so we didn't know how fast, but they're growing, man. It's doing things. Last year, or last weekend on Easter, they had more people there than they'd they'd ever had before, and we're going to reach some people down there just like we are here. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, hey, praise God. So, in light of that, are you ready for the word? So, so here's what I got going on. Um, I, I, I have this idea, and I'll tell you where it started. It started, uh, Michelle and I decided we'd go on vacation a few, few weeks ago. And uh, we decided that we'd go out to South Dakota, which South Dakota in April is a bad idea for the reference, all right? Just to let you know, because how many of you heard about the blizzard that was out there, all right? That was a bad idea. Okay, but anyway, one of the reasons we wanted to go out there was because... Uh, I went out there last summer. I had to come back because I had to do a funeral and then I flew back out there, but I only got one day in Yellowstone. And Yellowstone is absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. And if you've never been there, it's worth it. It's awesome. So in light of that though, um, I told Michael, I said, Mike, we gotta go out there. Michael's my son. I said, Mike, we gotta go out there. You gotta see this place. It's awesome. You're gonna love it. All right, little did we know that Yellowstone's closed this time of year, but that's irrelevant. All right, so, (laughs) oops. Uh, But in light of that, let me tell you what we did do. One of the things that we wanted to do was something I had never done before. Okay, so one of the things I had never done before is I had never snow skied. Okay, so in light of of that, Michelle had skied and so had Michael. So we get out there, we went over to the Grand Tetons, which is quite a ways, actually it's about six, eight hours drive. So we drive over there and we we end up at this place called Grand Targi, which is on the back side of the Grand Tetons, all right, which is the west side of the Grand Tetons. So anyway, we're out there, find this place and we're going to go skiing. So, so we get there and I go into this rental shop and I, I get all of our gear and Michael and Michelle and, and re- remind, I want to remind you that I'm the only one that's never done this before. So in light of that, uh, they get out there, you know, Michael puts his skis on and off he goes. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> See you later. So anyway, uh, so after that, um, Michelle gets on her skis and, and she's like, okay, I'm figuring this out again, you know, and she's doing her thing and she's doing her thing. I look at these things like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. They gave me sticks and skis. All right. So I throw them on the ground and I, I lock my, I'm trying to figure out how to lock my feet into the thing and how it all. And before I put my feet into this thing, I want to know how this contraption works. All right. So in light of that, there's this guy, how many of you I believe that I have this thing that I'm God's favorite? All right, and God, no, you could be his favorite too. Westfield, y'all could be his favorite. But in my world, I'm, so I show up there and I throw these skis onto the snow and this guy walks by and he could tell I'm clueless. All right, he goes, you've never done this before, have you? And I thought to myself, what gave you a clue? You know? So anyway, I said, no, I haven't. And like I said, I'm God's favorite. God gives me favor. So the guy walks over, he goes, well, he goes, do you mind? I could help you for a little bit. And I said, yeah, do you know anything about this? Now, obviously, he's got the whole get up, you know? First of all, anytime you go into a rental place and they ask you, do you want a helmet? <laughs> so anyway, I, I said, I said, I tell you what, I tell you what, um, I've never done this before. And if you got a few seconds, I go, do you know anything about this? He goes, yeah. He goes, I'm a ski instructor in Maine. And I just flew out here for a week to just be here. And, and, and it's funny because you talk to skiers, they remind me of surfers. Because they don't talk normally like, yeah, man, just came out here to check out the fresh powder, you know, man. <laughs> you know, 
saying, man. His name was Chris. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I'll help you, man. I'm like, hey, man, show me what's up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so I put my foot. He goes, here's what I want you to do. And here's what he did. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put one ski on in this scoot, just like a skateboard. I'm like, all right. So put one ski on, scoot like a skateboard. All right. He said, now take that one off, put the other one on, do the same thing. He showed me how to, he goes, now that you got the feel of it, here's what I want you to do. He says, I want you to take, I want you to take your sticks. I want you to push off. And then as soon as you do, I want you to do what we call the wedge. And what the wedge is, is you're going to sit down. You're going to bend your knees in and you're going to make your skis go out like this. How many of you know what the wedge is? All right, anytime a dude walks up to you and says, hey, do you want a wedge? Be careful, all right? But anyway, on this particular situation, it turned out to be all right. So anyway, we do the wedge. Anyway, he said, now, now just push and then wedge. Push and then wedge. Now, I did this for about 100 yards. He goes, hey, listen, here's the truth. Listen to what he said. He said, if you can master the wedge, you can master skiing, period. If you can master wedging, you can master anything. He goes, a lot of times people don't know how to ski because they can't wedge. If I can show you how to wedge, I can show you how to master anything when it comes to skiing. And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. So anyway, next thing, push, wedge, push, push, wedge, push, wedge. All right, that was my hour. All right? Anyway, he goes, okay, the next thing I want you to do is I want you to go down the hill. And as you go down the hill, I want you to wedge, but I want you to go like in an S pattern. And sure enough, you know, if I could wedge down the hill, now it looks silly because I'm sliding all the way down, but I noticed how if you wedge one way to another, you could control the skis. And I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. So a couple hours later, I'm going down the, down the little baby slope hills with the little four-year-olds, <laughs> but that's a different thing. All right. But then, then by the next day, man, shh, sign me up for the Olympics, baby. I got it figured out, man. And then the, be the best part of that whole thing was Michael skiing with me, right? And Michael, he's got more, you know. So he's coming down the hill really fast and I'm following him and I'm going slow. And all of a sudden, Michael starts flipping down the hill. Ski starts flying. He's digging his skis out of the snow under a tree. All right, hilarious. Now, here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. When it all came full circle, here's what I realized. Watch this. If you can master certain things, you can master things. Here, let me, let me translate that. I figured out in life that with anything you do, anything, I don't have to know everything about it. I just have to know the key essentials to unlocking it. Give you an example. I played basketball in fifth and sixth grade. Uh, and then in seventh grade at Bon Air, and then I went to Basil Mulby basketball camp, all right, downtown Kokomo High School, all right? And whenever I went to that basketball camp, the first thing they do is they pulled you aside and they said, hey, we want to teach you how to shoot. Now, I've been in fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. I've been shooting the basketball for a while. But they're like, no, we want to uh, train you how to shoot. And they said, listen, here's the key to shooting, beef, B-E-E-F, listen to it. If you can master this, you can know how to shoot a basketball. Anybody know what I'm talking about, beef? Anybody? All right, one person. All right, here we go. Check it out, beef. Balance, elbow, eyes, follow through. That's what they taught us. Balance, elbow, eyes, and follow through. If you can master those four techniques, you can shoot a basketball. That's what they told us, you know? So in light of that, I begin to think about it. You know, when it comes to God and when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the things of God, if you can master just certain things, you don't have to know everything about the Bible. You just need to know certain things. Because if I could get certain principles into your heart, it will unlock all the Bible. Is that fair? Certain things. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know certain things. So in light of that, let's kind of go with the premise of this. And here's what I want you to understand. Number one, you have to understand this. Satan's number one objective is to get you to distort the image of God in your heart and in your mind. Satan's number one job is to distort who God is in your world. So before I feel like I can go into really the keys that I believe will unlock the Bible and unlock your spiritual walk, it is with all my heart, I want you to understand who God is first. Now, I'm not going to give you 45 minutes of this, okay? I'm going to give you two hours. No, I'm just kidding. 
Some of you are like, seriously? <laughs> no, here it is. You ready? Let's talk about who God is. At his core, who is he? Okay? And again, you don't have to know everything about God. I'm going to give you just three or four things real quick. Number one, here's the first thing you need to know. For the Lord is, help me out. Good. Come on, Westfield, Kokomo, everybody. For the Lord is. Good. Say it one more time. The Lord is. Good. When is he good? All the time. Is he ever not good? No. no. God is good all the time, period. Listen to me. Right there, I done lost some people because they immediately begin to think, yeah, but what about stop? Yeah, but, 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 but get your butt out of the way. God is good. Everything you need to know about God is that God is good. Yeah, but grandma said, mama said, and listen, Bobby Boucher theology does not work. And mama said, how I many of you know, mama said that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that she's the devil and foosball is of the devil. Come on, where's my water boy people at? I thought I was by myself, all right? But here's the reality. The reality is this. The reality is this. Put aside everything you've ever been taught about God. God is good. And if it isn't good, it's not God. If it's not good, it's not God. Now, you can try and reason that any way you want to, but the Bible is very clear. For the Lord is good, his mercy and his everlasting, and his truth endures to what? All, help me out, generations. Let's look at the next thing God is. You ready? 1 Corinthians, for, and this is in the Amplified Bible. It says, for God is, help me, faithful. when is he? All the time. Is God faithful? Yes. Absolutely. Come on, everybody say, God is faithful. God is faithful. He is 100% faithful. Matter of fact, it goes on. He is reliable, trustworthy, and ever true to his promises. Ever true to his promises. If God said it, that settles it, I believe it. That's the way it is. Well, what about? Ah, get the whatabouts out of here. Know that God is absolutely faithful. So number one, we know that God is good. Number two, we know God is absolutely faithful. Let's, let me give you the third thing. And, and again, I could wear you out. There's like 45 different attributes that we could, I could bring to you just right off the cuff, all right? But in light of that, let's go to this one. He who does not love does not know God, for God is, talk to me, love. love. All right, one more time, Westfield Kokomo. God is, love. is God love all the time? Yes. Absolutely. God is love. God is love. There's no doubt about it. No, no shaking it. God is love. Now, whenever we talk about the idea that God is faithful, God is love, that God is absolutely committed to his word, he will always do what he said he would do, all right? When you talk about those things, then a, a lot of times people are like, okay, so, so that's all well and good, but I want to see it in action. The person that you can see it in action for more than anybody else is Jesus, Jesus is God's word made flesh. Or let me say it this way. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. So let me translate it and say it this way. If you ever struggled to know what God would do in a certain situation in your life, look to what Jesus did in the Bible. If you can figure out what Jesus would do, you would know what God would do because Jesus is God. Matter of fact, I'm gonna give you a verse just so you understand that. All right, I and the Father are one. They're one. Jesus and the Father are in complete agreement as to what happens on the earth. The Father and the Son are one. They, they are one, and it says it, essence or nature, absolutely. They completely agree. So now, it is the enemy's job to convince you and me that God is not good. Think about it all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, you'll find out that the reason Adam and Eve took and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is because Satan had convinced them that God was holding out on them and not giving them his best. Satan is a master at manipulating who God is. So it's important that we understand who God is. Now watch, if God is good and God is faithful and God is love, then obviously he has certain things he wants to establish in your life. And here's the deal, whenever it comes to it. Um, obviously, we know last week was Easter Sunday and all that good stuff. And, and, and we had a lot of new people coming into the church on both campuses, Westfield, Kokomo. And it's important in my world to come back the next week and say, okay, listen, can you wedge? 
can you wedge? All right, listen, I, you don't have to know everything about the Bible. Matter of fact, the less you know, sometimes the better. Can you wedge? If you can wedge, I can teach you all the other stuff. Listen to this. If you can understand that God is good, if you can understand God is faithful, if you can understand God is love, that will unlock everything else in the Bible. Promise you. Say, well, Pastor Charlie, what about, and I hear this all the time. What about Pastor Charlie when he said to go in there and wipe out a nation? Oh, time out. Go back and study those nations. Oftentimes you'll find that that was a mixed breed of angels and humans who had started populating the earth and God was having them wiped out, not because they were humans, because they weren't. They were a mix. And because of that, God said for them to go in. How many of you ever heard of David and Goliath. Goliath? You know, Goliath was a part of the giant race of human beings that were trying to take over the earth who was Satan's seed in the earth. Some of you are like, Pow. See, so there is a reason, and believe it or not, everything you find in the Bible, God was doing as an act of love. Not to be mean, but as an act of love. So in light of that, what does God want for you? What does God want for you? I'm gonna break this down in two levels. You ready? I'm gonna break it down on one level of what do I believe God wants for you, and then I'm gonna break it down to what God wants for you. Now, it sounds very similar, but I'll give you the difference here in a minute. But in light of that, let me just explain it this way. First thing you need to know is this. How many of you have a plan for your life? Okay, about three. Oh, wow. No, for real. How many of you believe God has something in your life he wants you to do? Okay, praise God. All right, now, now here's what I want you to understand. You ready? Here's what I want you to understand. The plans you have for your life are so far less than what he has for you. I'm serious. I know you may have the idea of I'm going to do this and I'm going to go to college or I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, and all that is well and good. But can I assure you of this? The plans he has for you are far, far greater. Anything that you have is at this level. Everything he has is at another level. And listen, he's a good father. He's a good daddy. Let me give you an example of this. Whenever a uh, uh, Michelle and I took the kids over to Michelle's aunt and uncle's over in Eaton, Ohio, which is the first exit on 70 out of Indiana. So we go over there. This was several years ago. Whitney had just, she was just about to get her driver's license. So we're over there and we're visiting with the family and hanging out. And while we're doing that, Michelle's uncle tells me, hey, I got this old Chevy truck out back that has a snow plow on the front and I'm going to be getting rid of it. Well, immediately my daughter picks up on this and she starts texting me, dad, I want that truck. I said, we do not want that truck. You say, well, why not? Well, it was all rusted. It had a big old plow on the front. It looked like a bunch of work. And let me say this. I know enough about my daughter that she needs a car that's going to go like 400 miles a gallon because when she gets her driver's license, she's going to run it ragged. <laughs> Come on, where you at, parents? Praise God. I knew that. And I told her, I told Whitney, I said, Whitney, we do not need a beat up raggedy old snow plow on the front truck. She's like, yeah, but I like it. I'm like, you do not know what that means. That thing is going to, I'm going to be towing that thing more than we are driving it. And every time you put a gallon of gas in it, it's going to go a half mile. Praise God. You're going to have to put more gas in that thing. Come on, y'all hear it. Hey, here's my, here's what I'm saying. She had a plan. But what she failed to realize is that dad had a better plan. Dad had a better plan. We were going to get her something. We, get her, we got her a Honda Civic, 40 mile a gallon, baby, and bulletproof on the outside. She had it one day and hit something. You hit something with a big old Chevy truck with a plow on the front? How many of you know daddy's paying for something? Praise God. So, so and listen to this. She had something, but I knew what she really needed. And watch this. And I had a better plan. And she loved that little car and ran the wheels off of it, all right? We actually bought it from someone in the church, Jared Orham's dad. So in light of that, let me give it to you this way. You ready? I believe with all my heart, God has plans for you. You say, well, what are they? Well, check this out. Here it is. For I know the thoughts I think to you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of what? Evil. Watch this. To give you a future and a... Does God have a future and a hope for you? 
come on, your daddy has a future and a hope for you. There's always a reason to have hope. Listen, God has, God has thoughts of you of peace and not evil. Peace and not evil. To give you a future and a hope. Does that include sickness? No. Poverty? No. Infirmities? No. Those are not God. If it's good, it's God. If it isn't good, come on, say it. It's not God. Come on, Westfield Kokomo, say it's not God. Come on, if somebody dropped off a bunch of rattlesnakes at your house, are you picking them up? Yeah. Now, God forbid you be a rattlesnake lover in the church, all right? But anyway, all right? I mean, I guess you can. It doesn't, okay, anyway, I digress. Here's my point. This is God's thoughts towards you. Let me go a little bit further. You ready? You may have heard it this way. John 10, 10. I know you've never heard that verse before. But the thief does not come except to what? Still kill and destroy. That's what the Bible says. The devil only comes for this. I had a situation just last night. A young girl walking through the church. She had a pentagram on her necklace. It had f- fallen out of her shirt. I pulled her. I said, hey, young girl. I said, do you know what that is? She goes, yeah, I know what it is. So I started drilling down on it. And she ended up telling me, she ended up telling me that she likes that. She likes that and it's all good. And she said, well, it's cool to have a friend who's a demon. She she said that. And I said, let me assure you of this. The devil and demons have one job, steal, kill, and destroy. Do not be deceived. And and, and I said that. Now, she was 12, 13 years old, so she was kind of naive to the whole deal. But how many of you know Pastor Charlie is not naive to that? Because I've dealt with that stuff before. And you need to not be naive to it either. The devil only comes for one reason, to steal, kill, and destroy. I say one reason, and then I give you three. That's like a preacher, isn't it? But anyway, it says, I have come that they might have and have it abundantly. Absolutely. So I got to thinking about this years ago. What does abundant life look like? What does an abundant life look like? So what does God want for each and every one of you in this room right now? What does God definitely want for you? Now, I'm going to give you these. Now, understand this. I do not own the patent on John 10, 10. Okay. But years ago, I was asking the Lord, this was after I started the church and everything. And I was asking the Lord, Lord, what does abundant life look like? What, what does that mean? What's that translate to? How does that work in my life and other people's life? And I came up with four things. These are the things that I believe God wants for your life. And matter of fact, to go a little bit further, these are not only the things that I believe God wants for your life, it is, it is the very things that I am praying for your life. Okay, so what are they? Number one, and you can write these down, you write these verses down. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper be in all things and be in Come on, say it. Say in health. Health. How many of you believe God wants you healthy? Absolutely. God wants you healthy. God wants your body healthy. He wants your body strong. Yes, he does. Listen to this. Sickness is limited death. Sickness is limited death. You need to look at every sickness like it is sent from the enemy, because it is. You say, well, Pastor Charlie, what about a cold? Okay, let me get it to you this way. All sickness has its root in one or two things. It's either an attack of the enemy or it's brought on by the fall of man, which was an attack of the enemy. It all has its root in Satan and his work. Say, prove that. Acts 10, 38, listen to it. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power to go about doing good and healing and healing and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Sick and oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Does God want you healthy? Absolutely. Should you be believing for your health? Absolutely. How many of you know you cannot do the will of God laid up in a hospital bed? All right? Several weeks ago, and it may be someone in this service, uh, it, we, I had someone come up to me and say, Pastor Charlie, will you pray for me? I'm sick. I said, absolutely. But as soon as I get done, I want you to go back to the room and I want you to go to that foo-foo thing in the back, vase, foo-foo thing, and I want you to grab a communion 
article out of there. And what I mean by that is we've got communion back there in the back in Westfield, you'll have them too. And we have communion articles, all right, which is the juice and the wafer. Tear the top off, I want you to take and say, Father, I believe your body was broken so that my body could be strengthened. And I want you to take that wafer. And then I want you to say, Lord, and I believe your blood was shed so that my sins could be forgiven. And I thank you that you have cleansed me from all my sin in Jesus' name. And then I want you to drink the juice, all right? I said, because we believe in communion, God can heal your body. Because we believe it is God's will for you to be healthy and whole and strong. You say, well, Pastor, I just don't believe that. And I'll ask this, do you go to a doctor? Do you take medicine? Well, yeah, I take medicine. Well, don't take it if it's the will of God for you to be sick. We don't want you fighting the will of God. Hello? Come on, amen? Come on, everybody say, God wants me healthy. All right, let me give you number two. 35 of Psalms, it says, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Let them say, what? Continually let the Lord be magnified, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his. Yeah. Do you believe that God wants to prosper you? Yes. Do you believe that prosperity is a part of what Jesus paid for? Yeah. God wants you blessed. God wants you blessed. He is not the God who takes delight in the poverty of his people. He wants you blessed. He wants you blessed. He wants you blessed. He wants you to be prosperous and be a blessing to other people. Amen? Amen. Let me give you the last one here. Check this out. Psalms 91 says this. With long life, I will satisfy you. Watch this. Satisfy him and show him my what? Salvation. With what? Long life. Pastor Charlie, you mean it is God's will for me to live long? Oh yeah, I want to live so long that I can annoy my kids. No, no, I, let me translate that. I'm going to go over and break their stuff and I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I don't know. I don't know. We had a situation just this morning, perfect illustration of this. All right, Michael, he's going over to a motorcycle safety class over in Marion because me, Michelle and I want him to get into a motorcycle safety class because he's Michael. And in light of that, I look out, I see him back in the 57 Chevy out of the, out of the drive and he's going down the drive and there goes my trash can, dragging trash down the, down the drive. So I walk out there and I pick up the trash can and I'm walking down the drive, putting the trash in it. He opens the door, he goes, did I do that? <laughs> yep. He goes, Hey, Dad, you mind getting that? <laughs> nope. See you later. Try not to break anything else on your way out the drive. <laughs> Come on, you might know what I'm talking about. I want to live old enough to where I can, I can go over there and just do stupid stuff. I want to eat their food. I want to break stuff and go, I don't know. Come on, where you at? Where you at, my peeps? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna tear stuff up. I can't wait. I'm gonna put me. In, I'm gonna hit stuff, and I'm gonna hang a handicap sticker on my rearview mirror. <laughs> oh come on! Here's the last one. All right, and then I'm gonna put it all together. You ready? Look at this. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children's children, my grandkids. So you say, Pastor Charlie, putting it all together, what are you praying for us? Here's what I'm praying for you, and this is the desire of my heart for you and for every person in this room. Listen to this. These are the four things that I believe God wants for your life. Health, wealth, long life, and a godly legacy. Did y'all hear that? Health, wealth, long life, and a godly legacy. Westfield, Kokomo, everybody together. Say it with me. Health, wealth, long life, and a godly legacy. Listen to this. You may disagree with those, so you, your interpretation of what abundant life is may be different than mine. I'm all right with that. I'm, I'm okay with that. But these are the four things that God spoke to my heart that I'm to li live for and believe for for you. So I'm praying for you to experience these in your life. Health. How many of you want to be healthy? How many of you want to be wealthy? Well, Pastor John, I just don't know if I want to be wealthy. Hey, listen, the Bible doesn't say money is evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Amen? 
So don't be, hey, I'm not, a, hey, if you're wealthy, praise God, just tithe. <laughs> All right? So health, wealth, what's the next one? Long life. Should you be believing to live a long life? Mm -hmm. Well, I seen it on Dr. Phil. They didn't live long. Well, I don't care what Dr. Phil says. The Bible says, with long life, I will satisfy thee. Well, Pastor Charlie, I think you got to eat organic. If you want to eat organic, go ahead. But listen to this. Organic won't allow you to override sickness. Only faith will. Right? Health, wealth, long life, and a what? Godly legacy. That's right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I sow into the next generation of my family so that they can be all God's called them to be. Amen? Amen? So now, in light of that, those are the four things that I believe abundant life is and God has for you. But now get this. In light of that, here's what the Bible says. And I'm not going to read this whole thing. I just want to read this first portion. And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come in abundance to you. Absolutely. Everybody say, that's me. That's me. You see, God wants to do, every spiritual blessing is going to come into you. So now here's the question. How do I tap into it? How do I tap into it? How do I tap into it? So here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you one today, and I'm going to give you th uh, four more next week. So there are going to be five total, all right? And this is really the fundamental or the core of what I believe God wants you to see, okay? So in light of that, let's go there. Romans chapter one through three. Now, everybody look at me and I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the book of Romans real quick so I can get to Romans chapter 12. Okay, so in light of that, listen to this. Romans chapter, chapters one to three deals with the, the idea that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many of y'all know that? Yeah. This is where we get that verse from, chapter three, all right? Romans chapter four through five deal directly with the idea of this. You ready? We're justified by faith in Jesus, and that's, that's it. In other words, let me translate it this way. You cannot be saved by your good works. Doesn't matter how good you are. Why? We were born in sin. You're not a sinner because you sinned. You're a sinner because you were born. And you were all born, right? Okay, so we all need Jesus, we all need salvation. Now, chapter six through eight deals with the idea of sanctification. Now, chapter six, verse one deals with the idea that you were buried and you were made alive in Christ. So when I say sanctification, I want you to hear this, a life empowered by the spirit of God being led by God. That's, that's what we're talking about when we say sanctification. Romans chapter eight, verse one says, for there, uh, for there is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So that whole thing, Romans chapter eight, verse 31, I believe it says, it says that for if the same spirit that, dwell, that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it's about being empowered by the spirit. And then you got Romans 9 through 11, which deals with the direct idea that God is sovereign over the nation of Israel. In other words, the salvation of Israel, ultimately God's going to work that out. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? So that's kind of a brief overview. Then we get to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and this is where I'm going. Now, listen, can you wedge? Can you wedge? If you can wedge, it will unlock everything else on scheme. Check this out, everybody. If you can get these five principles in your heart, it will unlock everything you need to know about God and the blessing that God will flow into your life. I believe this, all right? So what's the first one? What's the first one? Let's read the verse and then I'm gonna give it to you, all right? Here it is, Romans chapter one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You say, okay, there's a lot of wording in that, Pastor Charlie. What is it exactly saying? I'm going to break it down for you and give it to you in my direction. You ready? A surrendered heart. What does it mean to present your bodies as a living sacrifice? What's, it, what's that mean? It means to have a surrendered heart. It means to surrender your heart to God. It means to say, God, you're in charge. You're in control. You have your way in my life. You do what you want to do in my life. Listen to this. It is my opinion, and I believe this, that the conduit of God's blessing is always connected to a surrendered heart. When you read in the Bible, anytime God blessing someone, 
I promise you, there's never one person receiving from God who had a haughty or arrogant or high-minded idea or heart. No, nope. everyone God used, blessed, and ministered to humbled themselves before God. They said, God, I want to do life with you. I want you to take over my life. I want you to take control of my life. Every person that did that, phew, God moved in. God ministered to. But when they were haughty, arrogant, high-minded, thought they, they could do it all themselves without God, how many of you know Jesus had bad words to say to the Pharisees and Sadducees who thought they could do that? Yeah. But see, the truth is, God wants you and I to have a humble heart, to humble ourselves, to, to surrender to him. You say, well, what's the, sur the word surrender actually mean? Listen to this. By definition, it means to yield, to give up power over, submit, abandon, or relinquish. That's what I'm going to do. Now, let me just kind of go there for a minute. Because when we hear the word surrender, you know, we, we struggle with it. I mean, I know, I know about you. I don't know about you, but you, I'm American. Surrender nothing. Where you at? Come on. All right, surrender it. Now, we think of surrender as a weakness. Okay, and I will tell you in a typical environment of what we, you might be talking about, of course it's a weakness. You surrender because someone overpowered you. But let me explain it this way. When we talk about the word surrender, we're actually talking about someone of strength. See, because watch this, let me give it to you this way. Have you ever just wanted to, or maybe you have, not saying you did, but maybe you did, just somebody honked you off and you just let it rip, tater chip, you cussed them out. Am I ever done that? I'm not raising my hand like I participate. I'm just saying. <laughs> Haven't you ever done that? Huh? And then after you're like, whew, that felt good. Come on, you ready? All right, now get this. It's easy to let it rip tater chip. It's easy. Somebody honks you off. Somebody uses nonverbal communication to communicate things to you. <laughs> Right? I remember one time I was driving down the road. This really happened. Driving down the road. And you remember that Honda Civic I was talking about? I was driving it. Whitney had taken and put camo, pink camo uh, seats all over it and a pink camo steering wheel cover and all this stuff, right? So I'm driving down Markland into Kokomo from Greentown. I'm driving and this guy passes me, flips me off. Blah, 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 and then he pulled up, pulled up beside me when we were coming in to the new bypass. I rolled my window down and he had his down already. And I said, hey man, you're mad at the world, aren't you? He goes, that's right. And you look queer in that car. <laughs> Michael's with me, right? I'm like, oh no, not today. Yesterday, maybe not today, baby. Pull over, pull over, pull over. I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher. Preacher, pull that car, pull that big old Ford truck over, baby. Actually, it was a blazer. But anyway, pull that thing over a Walmart parking lot, praise God. Think I'm making fun of my pink seat covers. I mean, you know, that's easy. Let it rip, tater chip. The guy didn't follow me into the parking lot, and I'm glad. <laughs> I mean, I've thought about it. I mean, because what could be, there's two scenarios. Either way, it's making the paper. Here's one scenario. Preacher, and they would love this. The media would eat this up. They'd sell more newspaper. They'd finally sell a newspaper. But anyway, they... Preacher beats up local guy in Walmart parking lot. Wouldn't that be great? And this is the one that would really sell him. Preacher gets beat up by a guy in parking lot, <laughs> praise God. You know? Anyway, here's the truth and the reality of it. You ready? It's easy to do that. Watch this. It's hard to surrender. It's hard to surrender. It's easy to just let it rip. And a weak person lets it go. A strong person says, God, take over. So for example, just you guys know about this, last deer season, I'm pulling my four-wheeler on the back of a trailer, falls out the back of the trailer. Not even gonna tell you who tied it down. Michael. 
<laughs> we pull it out. The four-wheeler falls off the back. And we're getting it. We stop in the middle of the road. We're on 300 uh, South. And we, we're loading it back up. And this guy comes around us. You morons. You know what I said? You should be nice. <laughs> Michael said, that all you got, dad? Is that all you got? That's all I got, son. You remember last time I got called a queer and I wanted to beat the guy up? <laughs> that didn't go well. <laughs> I was just trying to be nice. But listen, here's the truth. You ready? How many of you know it takes the strong person to say, I'm not going to let people get under my skin? Watch this. I'm going to be strong and, and surrender this to God. Because here's the truth. Everything inside of you oftentimes doesn't want to. You know, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I've often said that God takes way too long and I'd much rather handle it myself. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Don't raise your hand. Do not raise your hand. <laughs> but here's the truth. You ready? The truth is, weakness is not surrendering to God. Strength is surrendering to God. Take strong people to surrender to God. So I'm going to give you three ways you can do that, all right? And I'm going to close it down, all right? So let me give you three ways. And it just so happens, to be very honest with you, they start with the S's, okay? So I'm going to show you how to surrender to God real quick. You ready? Number one, I taught this to my kids when they were very young, James 4, 7. Therefore, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Everybody say, submit. submit. Come on, Westfield, Kokomo, everybody together say, submit. 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 It takes strength to be able to submit. It takes strength to surrender, okay? First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna submit to God. God, take over. God, help me. God called me a moron. What am I supposed to do? Come on, y'all getting what I'm saying? I submit it to you. Listen to the next one. You ready? And, and listen, this applies in every, every, every area of your life. And you will seek me and find me when you search me with, your, with all of your heart. Next thing I'm gonna do, I'm going to seek him. Come on, everybody say seek. 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 I'm going to seek him. Let me give you the third one. You ready? Very, very simple. And this is pretty powerful though. This one actually, I wasn't in my notes until actually until Saturday at about three o'clock. I came into town. I went home. As I'm sitting there, this verse popped into my heart as I'm driving back to the house. And here's what it says. Be still and know I am God. That, that's a powerful, everybody listen to this and, and pay attention to this. It says, be still and know. I'm, I'm putting emphasis on it on purpose. Be still and know. Be still and know. You know, a lot of times we want to jump to the knowing. God, I want to know. Okay, the Bible says, be still, be still. So when you put it all together, here's what you're going to find out. If you really want to honestly just be a living sacrifice before the Lord, you're going to submit, you're going to seek, and you're going to be still. I'm going to submit myself to God. God, I, I surrender to you. I submit it to you. Have your way, God. Watch this. I'm going to seek you, Lord. God, have your way in this. Have your way in this. And Lord, I'm going to be still. I'm not going to say or do anything until I know you are speaking for me and through me. Because if I'm still, then I'll know. If I'm still, I'll know what to say. If I'm still, I'll know what to do. If I'm still, I know you will speak for me, God. If I'm still, you may handle it for me. I may not have to even get involved. If I'm still, come on, y'all getting what I'm saying? And if you'll apply that, when you say, well, Pastor Charlie, what's it mean when the Bible says, submit yourself therefore unto God? Or I'm sorry, when the Bible says, you know, to offer your body as a living sacrifice and surrender to the Lord, what's that mean? With all my heart, I, mean, I believe it means to submit to seek and be still. And so listen, if you're struggling with that, man, God wants to do something big in your life. If you're struggling, maybe you have something in your world that you're struggling with. Maybe you got something, maybe it is a sickness, or maybe it is just an annoyance, or maybe it's just schoolwork, or maybe it's a job issue, or maybe it's your business. Whatever the case is, I believe with all my heart, if you'll submit it to God, if you'll seek his face and just be still, I believe then you will know what to do. Come on. Amen? amen. I believe that with all my heart. Now, listen, before I close this down, if you, you're here today and you don't know Jesus and you'd like a relationship with God, listen, I want to invite you to the greatest thing you can ever do. And that is to ask him to be a part of your life. 
And if you would like to do that, maybe you've done it in the past, you'd like to recommit your life, or maybe, maybe, just maybe, you've never heard the gospel and you, you never have known that God wants a relationship with you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And if you'll pray this prayer, I believe with all my heart, I believe with all my heart, you'll be born again and you'll be on your way. So Kokomo Westfield, listen, if you're here today and you know Jesus and you have him as your savior, I want you to pray this out loud. Pray this out loud. If you're here and you'd like a relationship with Jesus and you never have, have had one, I want you to pray this out loud with us. And as you do, I believe with all my heart, God's gonna do something big in your life, all right? So if you would, please bow your head and let us pray. Father, I thank you for each and every person. I pray that you bless them and touch them. And Lord, if there's one here that needs to be born again, that you would save them today. So if I could have everybody pray this, say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe with all my heart, you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross. I believe he died for me. So therefore, I put my faith, I put my trust in him today. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody says amen. Now give the Lord a big old clap offering, praise God.